Vilandzi autors vadošajai monogrāfijai Eiropā par karteļu kriminalizāciju, ko 2014. gadā izdeva Oksfords universitātes prese. Šodienas tematiskā reize ir, ir tie taisni par to, par, par, par konkurences tiesību kriminalizāciju. Un, un šie te krimināli tiesiskie aspekti konkurences tiesībās ir bijis tāds jautājums, kas, kas ir aktuāls pie mums, kā mēs, kā mēs visi zinām, it sevišķi nesen, ja varētu arī satversmes tiesas spriedumu un diskusiju, kas tam, kas tam ir sekojis. Un, 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 un mēs ceram, ka šī te prezentācija būs liedrīgs pienesums šai te diskusijai un, un, un nedaudz varbūt nesīs vairāk, vairāk gaismas uz, uz, uz to jautājumu, vai Latvijā būtu liederīgi un, un iespējams un nepieciešams vispār domāt par, par konkrētas tiesību kriminalizāciju pēc būtības. Ja? Kā parasti ieslēgts ilgs divas stundas bez pārtraukuma, un galā mums būs ierastā jautājuma atbilšu sesiju 30 minūtes, ja mums tik daudz jautājumu būs. Latvijas tiesību institūta vārdēs vēlas pateikties mūsu ilgadīgajiem programmas atbalstītājiem, kas ir Rīgas latviešu biedrība, augstākā tiesa, Zirināt advokātu padomi, juristu vārds, konkurences padomi un Eiropas Senības tiesību asociācija Latvijā. Tas arī viss no manas puses, nāmas kungi, tādi jūs priekšā profesoru Vīlanu un aicinu uzmundrināt viņu ar, ar aplausiem. Well, thank you very much for inviting me here, Eddie, and thank you for your introduction, which I'm assuming uh, was, it was a great introduction. I understood the name of my, my monograph and that was about it. But I'm assuming that you uh, said that I'm going to talk today about uh, criminal enforcement of competition law, and that is indeed the case. So in terms of <coughs> my aims today, I have two aims. So the first thing I want to do is to examine the concept of employing criminal sanctions for competition law violations. So I want to look at this topic in general, with a specific focus on the EU, but looking at the justification for this sort of enforcement mechanism. After that, I'm going to explain to you and examine critically the UK experience with criminal sanctions so that you can understand how difficult it is to actually do this sort of thing, to use criminal sanctions for competition violations in practice. So there was a recent reform of the UK cartel offence and the reform changed the definition of the offence and also brought into play a number of new defences. And I want to take you through the reform so that you can understand the challenges here in practice. So in terms of the layout, I understand that I have two hours to speak to you. So I'm going to spend the first hour thereabouts looking at criminal enforcement of competition law in general. And then I'm going to move on to the case study, which is the UK cartel offence, and spend about 60 minutes on that as well. There will be a final part where we have some discussion for about 30 minutes. And I'm happy to be stopped at any time if I've said something you don't understand or if you want me to clarify something so that you can continue to follow the presentation. But of course, we will have time for more substantive questions at the end. So let's get started with our first part, looking at criminal enforcement of competition law in general. So here, we're again looking at the concept, and in doing that, what I want to do to you here today in front of you is to give you some context to the debate in Europe regarding the use of criminal sanctions for competition violations. Then I'll explain to you the reason why we have advocates in favor of criminal enforcement, so the primary justification. And that primary justification, it may come as no surprise to you, is deterrence. Then I'm going to detail some of the problematic issues here with cartel criminalization. There are numerous problematic issues. Now, I'm not saying these issues are so extensive that we shouldn't try to use criminal sanctions or that criminal sanctions in this context are ineffective, but we have to acknowledge the limitations because we might need to put in place some mechanisms to overcome those particular limitations if we decide that a policy of cartel criminalization is worth the effort. So I'm going to detail some of those. As was mentioned, I've written a book on this topic, and that book looks at a number of different challenges in this context, the theoretical challenges, the legal challenges, and the practical challenges. So I'm going to draw out some of that research for you. <coughs> of course, I'm not going to address all of the problems, but I will address some of the most pressing ones, or most interesting ones, and I'll give you some final points. <coughs> Excuse me, I seem to have picked up a little bit of a cough just arrived, but I, I should be okay. So we'll start here with the definition of a cartel. 
Now, people use the word cartel quite regularly in competition law enforcement. We can see over the years, however, that it's not really a legal term. It's become a legal term in the sense that you can see it's being used in, um, in notices, the leniency notice, for example, EU level. You can see it being used in directives. But the point here is that there's a little bit of fuzziness around the concept of a cartel. I mean, some people use the word cartel to refer to an anti-competitive agreement, irrespective of what the agreement covers. So it's important, I think, at the outset, if I'm going to talk to you about cartel criminalization, to just give you an idea, a working definition, as to what I actually mean here. Okay, so what I'm going to do is acknowledge this, that a cartel could actually mean the group of people that are involved, or a group of undertakings, let's say, that are involved in some anti-competitive practice. It could mean the actual agreement itself that's covered. Or it could indeed mean the practices underpinning an agreement, for example, price fixing or dividing markets. So which is it? Well, I think we can use the definition of the OECD here in its 1998 recommendation to help us. And I'm going to employ that definition. Now, if we actually take that definition and criminalize on the basis of it, in other words, we just turn that definition into a criminal offense, it will be too broad. I'm not saying that we should do that, but I'm going to move forward with this particular definition at this point. So what I'm talking about is an anti-competitive agreement, an anti-competitive concerted practice, or anti-competitive arrangement by competitors, horizontal competitors, competitors at the same level of the market, to fix prices, make rigged bids, that is collusive tenders, to restrict output, or to share divide markets, for example, by allocating customers, suppliers, territories, or lines of commerce. And that's quite broad, but it gives us enough to work with going forward. Of course, if we're going to argue that we should criminalize this sort of thing, this behavior, we have to understand the negative qualities of this action. In particular, what sort of impact it has that we don't actually like. So we could, first of all, talk about an increase in price. So we have a cartel that leads to a price increase. Now, some people, maybe economists among you, or economists out there, will say, so what? It's a price transfer, big deal. So the producer gets some of the wealth. Well, if you want that back, you can tax them. Okay, irrespective of that, the price rise will actually lead to a deadweight loss, that allocative inefficiency. So what happens? Well, because the price goes above the competitive level, we have people that would have purchased the product at that particular level, but are priced out of the market. Either they don't purchase the good at all, or they go elsewhere. So we have this unsatisfied demand, and certainly the economists would care about that, and we care about that. That's inefficiency. Okay. We also have, of course, a reduction in output. That comes about as a result of an increase in demand. Sorry, <clears throat> an increase in price. And we also may have other effects, such as a reduction in innovation because of the restriction of competitive constraints in the market. So these are things we don't like. We know, of course, that cartels are prohibited by EU law. We have Article 101 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. And of course, we know that we have national competition laws in each and every member state with prohibitions on cartels. OK, we all know that. Now, what's interesting here is that we have diversity in terms of the sanctions that apply to cartels. So we can see, for example, that there are relatively large fines imposed at EU level for cartel activity. But if we look at the different member states across Europe, we can see various different types of punishment in play, from the administrative to the criminal, to the sort of corporate enforcement, to individual focused enforcement, which is not criminal, which is administrative. And we have many different things that could um, arise in terms of that type of enforcement from director disqualification orders, to fines, to naming and shaming, etc. Now, traditionally, within Europe, we have avoided the use of criminal sanctions at national level. Now, it's important at this point for me to stop and explain what I mean by criminal sanctions. Because I'm not necessarily talking about the definition of criminal within the European Convention on Human Rights. The idea of criminal according to the Engels criteria, or the idea of criminal under the Menorini judgment. I'm talking about criminal in the sense that there's a potential term of imprisonment that needs to be served. 
Obviously, a company cannot serve a term of imprisonment, so we're talking about a focus on individuals who've engaged in cartel activity, and we're talking about the potential for those individuals to be sent to prison, to serve time in prison, i.e. custodial sentences. That's what I mean by criminal. Okay. Now, within Europe, in the last decade or more, there has been an increasing debate here regarding the use of criminal enforcement for cartel law in particular. So there is a focus on cartels, even though the main advocate of criminalization across the globe, the United States, technically has criminal sanctions for other types of anti-competitive behavior, for example, unilateral practices. But the prosecutorial approach there is not to actually seek enforcement in that context. Okay, now in terms of the debate in Europe, it has been advanced at different stages by different entities, some of which are European, some of which are non-European. Now we could take, for example, the OECD's Competition Committee. That committee published an influential report, the second cartel report, where it looked at cartel activity and gave some advice about how to enforce cart uh, cartel law in order to ensure that your regime is most effective. Now, the committee did not go as far as recommending all its members to introduce criminal cartel sanctions. But the committee acknowledged that there is potential for such sanctions to have a deterrent effect and that the members should at least contemplate introducing them if doing so would be in line with their social and legal norms. So what it stated was that there's potential for it to actually help us deter cartels, criminalization, but we shouldn't be unrestricted in our use of it. We should remember that the legal and social norms in a given jurisdiction can input into this discussion and should input into this discussion. Now, the Department of Justice, its antitrust division in particular, has been quite vocal in trying to encourage other jurisdictions to introduce criminal cartel sanctions. So it talks about it being the most effective way of ensuring deterrence criminal sanctions in this context. Now, <clears throat> one could be, we could look at all the, the speeches to, to see that, but one could be a little bit cynical here perhaps and see a reason why the DOJ, US authorities, would want to see criminalization occur in each and every member, each and every member state of Europe and of course each and every jurisdiction around the world because the United States is focusing on international cartels and has been since the mid 90s and if you have a cartel with individuals outside the United States that has an impact in the United States, it will be very difficult for the authorities to actually get hold of those individuals to send them to prison in the United States, unless either they are in the United States and are arrested, or they're extradited from foreign country into the United States. So, in order for that extradition to occur, what you usually require formal arrangement between the United States and another country, of course, but usually double criminality. Now, other things are required too in terms of usually required, such as uh, the length of time as a maximum. But nonetheless, criminalization is almost always required in these arrangements. So the United States has been trying to encourage other jurisdictions to introduce criminal sanctions, even if they don't enforce them, so that it will make it easier for them to uh, extradite individuals into the United States. Okay, now academics have had a role to play in this particular debate. I certainly have created some publications, as I've mentioned, but there are many other papers that have been published on this topic across many different issues and sub-issues that are of relevance. So this is a growing debate. There are many conferences and panel discussions and guest lectures on this topic. But importantly, although it's interesting for an academic, to write on this and input into it, it's not a mere academic exercise. So there's scope here for academics to have some impact as a result of their research. So we could look at, for example, the United, uh, the United Kingdom, which in 2003 introduced criminal sanctions. As we'll see later, it wasn't particularly successful in that regard and some change was required, again, on the basis of academic debate. Sweden considered introducing criminal cartel sanctions. It didn't do so, and the main reason that it didn't do so was that it was worried about the potential negative impact that criminal sanctions would have upon its administrative leniency program. 
Now, we have to understand that in Sweden, they have this principle of mandatory prosecution. If the prosecutor has the evidence regarding a crime, then it's required to actually uh, prosecute that crime. Now, there are some exceptions to that, but the point here is that they were worried that if they had to prosecute all individuals involved in a cartel, then that would have a negative impact upon administrative leniency because undertakings would not go forward for leniency for themselves from the fine, let's say, if in doing so they would subject their directors or employees to criminal sanctions. So what you needed, in effect, was to have a criminal immunity policy alongside the administrative leniency program to protect the leniency program. But they couldn't do that in Sweden. At least that's what they believed. My view, they don't need to change their constitution for it to be introduced. And we can see, actually, that the new directive that's been proposed, the ECN Plus, will deal with this situation in the sense that we have an in, a company that applies for immunity and is granted immunity in Europe. That will ensure that individuals involved with that company in that cartel will not be prosecuted in EU, in a criminal um, prosecution. Okay, so we also had Denmark who introduced them, and we had Finland, and I say currently considering them there on the slide, and um, I think in theory that's the case. I wrote um, a report for the Finnish authorities, a commissioned report a number of years ago now, and again this idea of Sweden came up. Finland looked at Sweden and had a similar issue with this mandatory prosecution principle, and I think that was weighing heavily on their mind, but they were, and this is public information, considering director disqualification orders as an alternative to criminal sanctions. So the idea that you have an order that would effectively stop an individual from being a director of a company for a certain number of years. Um, they may well introduce them after we have this directive, if it comes into play and is adopted, they may not, because there are a number of difficult issues here that need to be resolved, regardless of this principle of mandatory prosecution, which in my view can be overcome. So the issues are the following. We can consider whether it's necessary to have this sort of approach. And there is definitely room for debate here. I'll present the argument in a few moments, but there are assumptions in the argument, and those assumptions can be questioned. So the necessity of imprisonment as a method of enforcing competition law needs to be considered. <clears throat> and certainly there's no consensus on that. And the vast majority, I would say, of the literature on cartel criminalization focuses on that. Is it necessary or not? But in addition to that, we can consider whether it's appropriate. It might be necessary, but it doesn't mean that we should do it. Again, we could bring in the idea here of legal norms or social norms or morality, for example. And there certainly is potential for differences in attitude concerning the criminality of cartel activity. So if we took surveys in different jurisdictions across Europe, we may well get different results regarding people's views on whether engaging in cartel activity is wrong. Now, some surveys have been done, and it has been shown that there is a bit of divergence across the EU. And in fact, there's divergence between the EU and the United States, but perhaps not as much as one would expect. But nonetheless, there is potential there for that to have an impact on the debate. Now, as you'll see from my examination of the United Kingdom later in this presentation, there are certainly difficult issues to do with practicalities. How do we actually design the criminal cartel offence? If we just went back to the OECD recommendation and its definition, it would be too broad, one would argue. Certainly doesn't look at anything to do with efficiencies. And it's questionable if it lines up with morality, which in my view it should to a degree. So we have this issue here of what should we actually contain within our offence to ensure it captures the criminality we want to capture but isn't too overly broad and chills behaviour at the margins. And of course there are other issues to do with implementation in terms of the design of the prosecutor. Um, we also want to think about the impact of human rights. If you're moving from an administrative setting to a criminal, you may well keep the administrative regime with fines on companies, let's say, and also have your sanctions on individuals which are criminal. And there are issues to do with exchange of information, for example, between those two types of regimes, or indeed the idea that you're taking resources from one type of enforcement and putting it into another, 
What if that other enforcement, that criminal enforcement, is so difficult because the human rights guarantees shoot up, they're stronger when it, we're talking about serious criminality, people going to prison, than they would be in the administrative setting, such that it becomes so difficult to actually get a successful conviction. Well, then what you're doing effectively is taking resources from a relatively successful administrative regime, let's assume, and ensuring that those resources are used for failure in the criminal one. So we need to think about that. How do human rights impact upon the effectiveness of the enforcement if those human rights guarantees are stronger when it comes to the criminal setting? And of course, we need political and public support because this requires a lot of investment, a lot of patience in particular, and we also need to have some publicity here and we have to have public support alongside that. And we could also talk here in Europe in particular about the competence of the EU institutions. Could they mandate the use of criminal sanctions in each and every member state? In my view, that's technically possible. I don't think it's politically possible, though, and therefore it's not going to happen anytime soon. But I think there is a possibility of that, but it would require um, some maneuvering. Okay, so that's the context, <coughs> which I'm sure most of you are aware of already. Now we're going to move to the second part of this presentation. And I'm going to focus on the primary justification for criminal sanctions. So you know why it is that those who argue in favor of criminal sanctions actually so argue. <coughs> as I said, it should come as no surprise that we're talking about deterrence, the idea of stopping someone from doing something. And we can see that in the literature. These quotes are taken from the United States, they're still valid, they're certainly used quite a lot in the literature, recent literature. Criminal sanctions are the most meaningful deterrent to antitrust violations, according to Lyman. Bauer says they send a message to other business executives about the risks and penalties for this kind of behavior. Okay, so we're focusing on deterrence. We're talking here about policymakers wanting to stop cartel activity from occurring in the future. Now that sort of deterrence could be general or it could be specific. You might be, for example, trying to stop anybody or other people to the cartels you're criminalizing from engaging in cartel activity. So they look at the people who've gone to prison and decide not to engage themselves in that activity. Or it could be specific. You're punishing a given individual so that in future that individual won't engage in cartel activity. It could be either of those. But in the literature, there's a consensus that when deterrence is employed in this context, it's usually about the general aspect, other people listening and learning from people going to prison. Okay, so what's the approach here? Well, it's <coughs> an economic variant of deterrence theory. So what we do here is first of all, assume that the cartelists, we can use the word undertaking at this point, are rational self-interested entities. So they engage in activity if after a cost-benefit analysis, it's in their interest. In other words, they'll make more money from engaging the activity than desisting from it. That's all they care about, profit, okay? So they're not caring about sort of social losses, embarrassment if they get caught, just simply how much will they make? How likely is it they'll get caught? And what will they face as a penalty if they do get caught? And they weigh those things up. Now if we follow principles inherent in this economic deterrence approach, we can take an equation and use that to set the optimal fine. So at this point, I'm going to assume we have no criminal sanctions. We just have administrative sanctions against the company. Okay, so the company doesn't go through a criminal procedure, it goes through an administrative procedure and it faces a fine as a sanction. The question that's begged is, well, what size should that fine be if we are actually going to deter the company from engaging in cartel activity? That's the first question. Well, we need to set the fine at least equal to the expected benefits of the cartel, but it must be discounted to take account of the rate of detection and prosecution. So, if for example, an individual were to make 100 euros from a violation of the law, should we set the fine at 100 euros to stop the individual from engaging in the practice? Of course not because not everybody's going to get caught. If every single person got caught immediately, then we would set the fine at 100 and the person wouldn't do it. But because not everybody's going to get caught, we need to increase the fine in proportion to the rate of detection and prosecution. 
Okay, so that's what we do. We take the benefit and we start to increase that to take account of that fact. Now, if we put into the equation figures on cartels, we can come to a rough estimate as to the value of the optimal find, a find that would, in theory at least, stop cartels from occurring. Now, what we're using here are statistics from discovered cartels. Cartels are secret, we know that. Could be one, two, three, could be hundreds in existence in a jurisdiction at any given point. We don't know. All we know is what we've discovered. So, but taking that, and that's a caveat, but taking the discovered cartels, we can come to some understanding as to how long they usually last and what sort of price rise usually occurs. And we can make assumptions about how much benefit they would take from that price rise. Now, all of this is open to debate, of course. But in terms of using our equation to find the optimal fine, we can use those figures to come to a rough estimate of the fine. So according to Wills, and he's done this on a number of occasions with new data when it became available, it needs to be 150% of annual turnover. So we've got the profit, which is estimated at, let's say, 10% of annual turnover in the cartelized market. That goes on for about five years. But we have one in three cartels being detected. I think that's a pretty conservative estimate of the detection rate. What do we have? We have 150% of annual turnover. Now, some say that should be even higher. What does it not take account of? Well, it doesn't take account of the rate of interest. It's going on for five years here, the assumption is. So each of those years, we have illegal gains being taken and used or invested or what have you. So you need to have a rate of interest as a free loan, effectively. So you need to increase it up to 200%, according to Calvani or Greg Verdon from the DOJ. Okay, now you, you might say, well, so what? Impose the fine then, let's be severe. This is cartel activity after all. Let's impose that fine. But this is the difficulty. It cannot be imposed legally, although sometimes that's not the case, but more importantly, practically. Okay, so for legal reasons, we do have a 10% cap at EU level, and we can see in the, in the directive that's proposed, ECM plus directive, we're going to have a rollout of that cap across Europe. It's worldwide turnover, and it's not just a cartelized market. Okay, but the point here is that that will usually be met unless we have, let's say, the cartel being one fifteenth of the overall operations of the company. So that's an issue. We might want to keep that because there are good reasons for having the cap in terms of proportionality. Fine. The more important reason for not imposing the optimal fine, so the theory goes, is because it could lead to the liquidation of the company. The company won't have the assets to pay the fine. So effectively, it's the death penalty for the company. And there has been some study of this in the United States, finance, it's, it's, it's old enough, this sort of study. But we had very high percentages, over 58% of companies that would not be able to pay an optimal fine when it fell due because they don't have the assets. Now, let's not forget that they've already probably paid out the cartel uh, benefits by the time they're discovered, either in bonuses to staff, in salaries, or indeed to in dividends to the shareholders. And there is some empirical evidence about that. Simon and Verdon have looked at this, and there is some empirical evidence saying that it eventually ends up uh, being captured by trade unions in the United States. And that, that literature is a bit old, admittedly, but the point is they haven't earned the money anyway. So what happens? You impose the fine, company goes out of business. There are social costs involved, at least in the short term, in terms of reduction of tax, that's collected, we have people losing their jobs, we have that sort of friction that we might not want, but also we have increased concentration in the market. And this is a market, let's not forget, that has already seen a cartel, so it might be quite concentrated. And we have further concentration, which may lead to further cartels. So we have an issue with that. So what do we do? Well, we could leave it there and say that's just inherent in the system, and let's hope that our assumption about rationality, our assumption about the ability to figure out what the optimal fine is, and sorry, the fine will be, and then act accordingly, isn't actually relevant or valid in reality. Okay, we could do that, or we could turn to the individuals. And those in favor of criminalization argue we should turn to the individuals. 
But the point here is this, that we shouldn't just impose a fine on the individuals because the company may pay the fine. Certainly the company is incentivized to pay that fine, according to the theory, all the way up to 150% of annual turnover as the uh, absolute size of the fine that it will face. Okay, now you say, well, we could ban them actually doing that. And New Zealand looked at this uh, when they were considering criminalization uh, in 2012. And I have to say they're, they're actually considering it again at the moment. Okay, but that can be difficult to police. And how do we know that some bonus or some salary, some part of the salary isn't a premium that's paid for the risk of going to prison if they engage in activity that benefits the firm, but which is illegal? It's difficult to enforce. So the idea here is that you must impose a sanction that's non-indemnifiable, that the company cannot pay or cannot pay a premium for the risk involved in its occurrence. And that's where criminal sanctions come in. The individuals, the executives, the smart suits don't want to go to prison. They won't run the risk of going to prison to engage in cartel activity to the benefit of their corporation. That's the idea. Now, there are additional arguments that are made in this context. So, for example, if you have criminal sanctions and you have criminal immunity, you can potentially improve the operation of your administrative leniency program. I'll explain that a little bit later. But these instrumental type arguments are usually just tacked on to this deterrence-based argument. Without this deterrence-based argument, I think you have a weak case for criminalization is the point. Now, very few people argue that you should send people to prison in this context because what they've done is wrong. Forget the impact in terms of deterrence, but they're engaging in some sort of immoral behavior and we're going to enforce the law against these people who are engaging in that sort of immoral behavior. Very few will make that argument. That's not to say it's irrelevant because it can also be added to bolster your deterrence-based argument if you wish to do so, and I think one should do so, and I'll look at that a little bit later. I've put this up here just for illustrative purposes. I didn't create this, I was a little bit lazy. I sort of copied and pasted this from a US <coughs> law firm's report. It's not exactly accurate. There are a couple of countries that are missing. I was in Kenya in September, and I realized they have criminal sanctions too. They don't impose them, so Kenya should be added, and I'm actually going to Chile next week. They also have criminal sanctions, that should be added, but there are others too. But you get the point. You can see from Australia to Canada to Brazil, over to Japan, down to South Africa. This is a global, a global movement, okay? Now what's interesting here in particular, irrespective of this worldwide trend to criminalize cartel activity, very few countries have actually sent people to prison. Very few. The United States is the exception, really. The United States regularly sends individuals to prison for extended periods of time. So we're talking here an average of something around 34 months, something like that. Okay, even though they have a maximum of 10 years in the United States. But other countries have had some people to go to prison, but it wouldn't really be a major risk for, I would say, for, for individuals to engage in cartel activity in those countries. So the United Kingdom has sent a couple of people to prison, Israel to Germany for bid rigging, apparently, but few others. Now, there are ongoing investigations in Australia, and prosecution is likely to uh, occur there. And we have statements from enforcers about how serious they are about cartel uh, criminalization, how they want to achieve um, a successful policy of cartel criminalization. But going forward, we have to, have to see whether that will be the case in practice. Okay. What I'm going to move on to now are some of the problematic issues with this particular pro-criminalization argument. And I'm just going to focus on three. <clears throat> the first one is the assumption of rationality. So I just want to question whether that is something that is um, realistic in this context. I think it's more realistic than in other contexts. I'll focus on whether criminal cartel sanctions are efficient as opposed to effective as well. So the arguments in favor have tended to focus on how effective they can be. People listen, people don't engage in cartel activity when criminalization is in place. But that might be so costly to occur that it's not worth the effort. Let's not forget we're talking about an economic crime here. So the economic side of it is very, very important as opposed to the moral side of it. 
However, morality is still relevant, and I think the debate here needs to capture discussion around the morality of cartel activity. Why is it culpable? Why is it seriously harmful? But more importantly, why is it morally wrongful? And I think if we can create an offence that captures that sort of moral wrongfulness, we're in a stronger position than if we were just to capture or create an offence that, that captures uh, the activity that we want to deter. Okay, so we might need to reduce the scope of the offence in order to ensure it lines up with morality because that brings with it advantages. Okay, so if you didn't follow any of those points I just made, I'm going to go through them now in a little bit more detail. Okay, so going back to the argument that was put <clears throat> in favour of cartel criminalization for deterrence reasons, we can see there was an assumption there. The assumption was one of rationality, the idea that the undertaking engages in cost-benefit analyses and then decides what to do on the basis of those cost-benefit analyses. Now, of course, undertakings are made up of individuals and they are the ones, ultimately, that are going to be engaging in this practice if that occurs. Now, the point here is that there is a growing literature that critiques this sort of approach, this idea that individuals or indeed companies that are made up of individuals, are rational, and that there are a whole host of different factors that influence decision-making. <clears throat> so we have this growing field of behavioral economics, and there is certainly something to be learned from that field. For example, we can see, according to surveys and experiments, that there is a normative commitment of obedience to the law. Individuals will usually adhere to law and obey the law if they believe it's legitimate. Either it's been legitimately created through the process that they expect it to go through, or the outcome, the actual law itself or its application in a given instance, is perceived to be legitimate. Then they will like it and they will adhere to it, even if it would be in their interest to break that law, to make money. If they could break the law, get away with it and make money, they wouldn't do it because they actually have internalize the norm because they feel it's legitimate. Now you might say, what's he talking about here? Well, if I said to you that we were to get rid of the murder law that exists in this country tomorrow for one day, whoever committed a murder on that day would not go to prison. It would be unlawful for the authorities to arrest you because it's not criminal for one day. How many people here would sit down and work out how much money they can make from committing a murder and then would see that they've got no punishment in terms of prison anyway, and then decide to act on that and go ahead and commit a murder. Probably very few, hopefully nobody. Because you've internalized the norm, you agree with the law, you think it's a legitimate law, irrespective of how much money you can make from breaking it. Now we forget that in this debate, if we're just going to look at rationality. Now of course that makes assumptions. It makes assumptions that the population understand cartels. And also that they have an assessment of the morality of the cartel and come to a conclusion that criminality in this context is appropriate. So it goes back again to the morality debate, which I believe is important here. Okay. Now, second to that is the idea that if we look at studies, we can see individuals often react in a different way to that predicted by financial incentives. Now, one example that's often put out here is the idea of the nursery. And there's this example where you had a nursery that didn't have any fines, let's say, if you came to collect your child late. So let's say you have to pick your child up at six o'clock from the nursery, you arrive at five past six, there's no fine. There's no extra payment. There's just a dirty look from the person that you're picking the child up from, and there's a bit of embarrassment and what have you. People adhere to it. They try to get there at six o'clock at the latest. But you bring in a fine because you think it's starting to become a problem, perhaps you bring in a fine, what happens? People see it as a tax. Okay, six o'clock is the time, but if for whatever reason I'm going to be there by ten past six, I'll just pay the fine and it'll be okay. So beforehand, it was you know, free effectively, but you didn't do it. After you introduced the fine, it actually cost you to do something and you do it. So it's just, it's just, uh, just an unusual example perhaps, or a good example for illustrative purpose of how people might actually respond differently to, to that predicted. 
And of course, if we look at this literature, and I'm not adding to this literature, of course, there are plenty of people who have done so. There are many different educational, sorry, environmental and situational issues, and indeed educational issues, that can impact here on whether someone engages in criminality or not. Okay, so it might depend on the culture in the company. If the culture is very strong against cartels, for whatever reason, then that might not occur. If, uh, uh, by contrast, the company has engaged in cartels quite regularly in the past, it's expected from senior management, you have this culture for cartels, that may push someone towards cartel activity irrespective of the financial aspect of it. Okay, and you can see also that individuals do care at some level about social embarrassment. You know, so if we have a company that's engaged in cartel activity, it gets caught, the CEO might be embarrassed at the golf club. And that might enter into the assessment whether engaging in cartel activity in the first place is a good idea. So they might want to avoid the social embarrassment. So if we just focus on this deterrence aspect, we forget this. And certainly if we have naming and shaming as part of our cartel regime, then we can take advantage of this sort of uh, worry, social embarrassment. Okay, now you might say, well, what about the empirical data? Well, there's not very much about this, actually. But Parker and Nielsen did some surveys in Australia of businesses and they interviewed quite a number, well, they surveyed quite a number of businesses here and they did find that there was a concern for informal economic and social losses. So it wasn't just about how much money they could make, what the chances were of getting caught, that would negative any of that benefit, but it was also about, well, what will my friends think of me if this comes out? Those sorts of things did come into play. Now, also, if we're looking at rationality, there's this single approach. It's the idea that you've got one decision maker who knows all the information and inputs that information into an equation and figures out whether to engage in the activity. The idea here is that that's not realistic. Okay, look at Beaton Wells, Karen Beaton Wells' article in the Journal of Antitrust Enforcement where she looks at this issue and she determined from surveys that in fact a number of factors influence our ability here to figure out what would happen in terms of detection, in terms of punishment. So she could see that things such as gender had an impact. Your gender had an impact on figuring out how much sanction you would actually face if caught. Also the normative appraisal of the law had an impact on the assessment. So it, the point here is that it's not as simplistic as one assumes. Now, my point here, and I'll finish up with rationality after this, is that rationality, although it's subject to limitations, it has a place potentially in this sort of debate. Because we're not talking about people engaging in, in, in sexual crimes, we're not talking about murder, we're not talking about people who are engaging in drug activity because they're addicted to drugs. We're talking about educated people in a particular context trying to make money and they have a legal obligation to maximize the, the value of their uh, shareholders' holdings. And the point is that this profit maximization might be best served through cost-benefit analyses in that context. So I'm not saying it always happens. What I'm saying is it's more likely to happen in that context than in other contexts where you have criminality and law-breaking. And the point here is that the more competitive it is in business, the more likely it is that people will engage in this sort of activity. Because if you are not a good manager who's able to use cost-benefit analysis to your benefit, you might lose your job and therefore you leave the market as such. So the idea is that there's potential here to see the market creating a situation where people are forced to engage in this sort of behavior, to think rationally before acting, work out how much it would cost and how much uh, they would benefit and act accordingly. So the point is there's a theoretical argument here, but we need some empirical uh, underpinnings and we don't really have that. Okay, I think this is more interesting. <coughs> Now, the deterrence-based argument that I explained to you earlier basically states that criminal sanctions are necessary because imprisonment is the only way of ensuring that the expected value of punishment would be at least equal to the cartelist's unlawful gain. It's the only way, in other words, for an effective sanction to operate. Now, there are questions about that, of course. 
and we've dealt with some of those under rationality. But even if it's true, and let's assume it is true that cartel criminalization is effective, it doesn't mean we should adopt it. Now, some people might say, what, what do you mean? And if we look at the literature, we can see often people will argue that you should adopt it because it's effective. Well, we have to remember that imprisonment or cartel criminalization brings with it costs. And we're trying to ensure that we reduce the cost on society by eliminating cartels. We're not getting rid of cartels because it's some sort of inherently morally wrongful activity like, you know, um, a burglary or something like that. We're talking about its economic impact in, in, in the economy. So we're talking about economics. And yes, we might be able to eradicate cartels with criminal sanctions, but it might cost us so much to do that that it's not worth the effort. Now, what am I talking about? Well, obviously setting up the enforcement apparatus and all the things that it involves. That's obvious. But we have more robust human rights guarantees going from an administrative setting to the criminal setting. You have higher standards. That will depend on your national law. But by and large, I would expect higher standards to come into play. That brings with difficulties in securing evidence and therefore more investment is required in, for example, criminal investigative techniques and wiretapping and running human agents inside the cartels and doing these sorts of criminal things, criminal investigative techniques that are required. The cost of trials themselves, now they're likely to be contested if individuals are facing significant term of imprisonment, educated, wealthy individuals perhaps who don't want to go to prison are going to contest it. Imprisonment itself is a cost. And we have to remember here, not just you know, feeding people in prison and paying the prison guards, we're talking here about taking good people out of society, those otherwise productive individuals who might be running charities, who might be going into schools to give talks to children, all sorts of interesting and uh, useful behavior on their behalf might be appreciated by society, but we're taking them out of society for the prison term. Now, we could get economic here, and if we're being very specific and accurate, we would need to be. What we want to do here, of course, is ensure that you are able to impose the criminal sanction at some point where you have marginal cost equaling marginal benefit. The marginal cost of the enforcement apparatus is equal to the marginal benefit. There's nothing controversial in that. The problem, however, is that we just cannot demonstrate that that will ever be the case. I gave evidence to the New Zealand Parliament, to their Commerce Committee, when they were uh, introducing criminal cartel sanctions uh, in New Zealand. In the end, they decided against it, but they went through the process of discussing it and created a bill, including criminal sanctions. As part of the discussion, I presented some of my research. The, quest, the very first question I was asked is, where's the evidence? Demonstrate this works. And I can see their concern. Of course they want that answer. I want that answer. But the problem here is that I can't give that answer. No one can give that answer. And the reason is very simple. Cartels are secret. That's it. Okay? So we cannot know how many cartels exist at a given point and then compare it to some other point in the future. So we couldn't, for example, look at our regime, let's assume we have no criminal sanctions, just administrative sanctions, figure out how many cartels we have, put a value on that in terms of... Um, the harm to society, introduce criminal sanctions, and then measure how many cartels are left. Put a value on that. And then see how much it costs to actually criminalize and see, if, see how they weigh against each other. See what we've saved and see what it's cost us. We can't do that because we can't do that simple measurement of before and after. Now, I'm not saying that's the end of the matter, therefore we've got to forget about criminalization. But we have to acknowledge that limitation that we're not going to get to a point where we can scientifically prove that cartel criminalization is worth the effort. Okay, now <clears throat> we have some anecdotal evidence. Anecdotal evidence that we could try to rely upon in you know, bolstering our argument here, and fine, I'll put it to you. We have to be careful with anecdotal evidence, of course. There's plenty of anecdotal evidence demonstrating the existence of, of aliens and abductions, etc. So we have to be careful. Okay, so what anecdotal evidence can we look at? Well, we can see here that there are international cartels, and some of them actually carve out the United States. They could easily include the United States, sell into it, have an effect in the United States, but in doing that, they're opening themselves up to potential criminal sanctions. 
Okay, so that's a bit of evidence. If you talk to US officials, they will say that no cartless has ever offered to go to prison instead of paying a fine. Quite the opposite, in fact, they want to avoid going to prison, so they care about it. And in terms of defense lawyers, um, the ones I've listened to and the ones I've read about in, um, in the literature have talked about the ears of the cartelist picking up when we're talking about prison sentences as opposed to a fine on the company. So the point here is that they might listen and it might have an impact. So the question then, instead of being very technical, talking about marginal cost, equal marginal benefit, which we can't really do, we will talk about whether they're capable of generating more benefits than costs or are the advantages greater than the disadvantages? You know, what are the sorts of arguments we can look at in favor and against when it comes to looking at potential costs and, and benefits? Well, one argument that's put forward is we could have significant benefits here, even by just deterring a couple of big cartels. So if we look at some of the major cartels, we can see we're talking about a huge amount of commerce. And if we deter just a couple of those, we could be talking about significant savings. We don't have to have long terms of imprisonment. So we're not talking about, you know, trying to deter someone who is a hitman, who might be prepared to spend five, ten years in prison and come out and have a whole pot of gold waiting for him after his activity. We're talking about individuals that will probably try to do anything to avoid going to prison. And so we don't need very long terms. We can focus on the most serious cartels. And <clears throat> I think you would be advised to do that going forward with criminalization. At the moment, as I said, Chile has introduced criminal sanctions. They are consulting on prosecutorial guidelines for the authority um, to, to make decisions regarding putting a complaint in front of the prosecutor in Chile. And the focus here is on serious cartels. How do we know if a cartel is serious or not serious, etc.? And there's a whole load of things we could discuss around that. But the idea is you focus on the big, impactful cartels and the message hopefully will be learned. Now, of course, we can use other techniques here to reduce cost. That's what we're talking about, trying to reduce cost in the enforcement. We can bring in plea bargaining. In the United States, you have plea bargaining. It's a major part of the system huge proportion of the uh, enforcement activity uh, relates to plea bargaining. Something like 90% of successful convictions are obtained through plea bargaining. What's interesting though, is that if you don't go forward with a plea bargain in the United States, statistically, you're far more likely to get an acquittal than with any other crime, um, according to the literature. So there's, there's an issue there to be looked at. Okay, you can use individual criminal immunity programs. I think you would have to do that anyway in order to ensure your administrative leniency program isn't negatively affected. No one's gonna come forward if it means their friends are going to prison or their employees are going to prison. So we have to bring in individual criminal immunity. We could use bounties, payment of some money for evidence. Be careful and wary of that, of course. Um, what we could do, though, is require the cartelist who's been convicted to actually pay towards the cost of the prosecution, the trial, investigation, etc. That's possible in Ireland. They introduced uh, an amendment to this Competition Act in 2012. So there's a possibility. It hasn't been used as far as I'm aware. But we could use that to get money from the cartelists to help pay for our enforcement regime. And of course, we can still impose fines on individuals. So we can recoup some of that cost through the sanction that will be imposed on an individual as part of the criminal procedure. So there are some ways in which we might keep the enforcement cost down, but bottom line, and I'm going to stick to this, is that any measure of the deterrent effect here is always going to be inherently speculative. We can't get beyond that, okay? So we can make some guesstimate as to how we can get a certain benefit from it and what have you, but it's always going to be speculative. And that's due to the secrecy of the cartel. Now, I mentioned plea bargaining before. It may well work in the States, but in Europe we have a different culture. Often there are no formal systems of plea bargaining in the member states. And of course, there is this cultural opposition to it, the idea that you're placing pressure on individuals who are ultimately innocent and may well be proven to be innocent or at least not convicted if it goes in front of a court because they're facing a significant term of imprisonment and therefore it's unfair. So 
the idea here is that it's not necessarily a good idea in Europe. And also, if we're introducing criminal sanctions to sort of create a moral norm against cartels, people learn from the criminal law what's wrong and what's right, often. Well, we're going to undermine that effort if we are not sending people to prison because they've plea bargained, et cetera, to keep the cost down. So there are different issues that need to be considered there. The same point can be made for low terms of imprisonment. If you're going to convince people in society as an advocate of cartel criminalization that this activity is very harmful and perhaps even morally wrongful, such that individuals should go to prison, that sort of message is undermined if you say, well, yes, they should go to prison, but should only go for a month or six months. People say, well, it's not really worth it then. If we're going to prison for three or four years because that's the sort of crime it really is, that's a different thing. But for six months, it's not worth it because it starts to undermine this creation of moral norms that you want to do. So we have to be careful here. And of course, those techniques that I mentioned in terms of leniency and bounties, they already exist in most places when it comes to, some of them anyway, when it comes to administrative enforcement, or at least they could be used in the administrative setting. So if you're going to use them to reduce the cost involved in moving from the administrative to the criminal, they have to show additional advantages in the criminal setting. Otherwise, you're, only, you're already going to get the advantages from them. Okay? So they need to show additional advantages. Now, some put forward arguments that bounties show additional um, advantages with criminal sanctions, that companies will not game the system with um, applying for leniency at different points for different cartels as part of some sort of agreement among them if, if, um, if you're going to uh, go to prison as a result. Um, I think the point, though, about administrative leniency could be made again, which is that they show additional advantages if you've got criminal immunity in place it may, and criminal sanctions. It may lead to an improvement of your administrative leniency program because there's an additional race to the regulator. As a company, the, the, board, the board as part of the company may make the decision to apply for leniency because if it doesn't do so very soon, its employees might get caught. Okay, so if you have that sort of setting, it might actually have a positive impact upon your leniency program criminalization, but it requires criminal immunity to be in existence, otherwise there will be no applications. Now, some have argued when Brazil and Australia introduced criminal cartel sanctions alongside uh, sorry, criminal immunity, you had um, an uptake in the uh, applications for administrative leniency, but that's anecdotal and some have questioned that. Okay, now another point here, and this is the final point when it comes to efficiency, is that the judiciary may be very hesitant to impose criminal sanctions on individuals. The judges might well be sympathetic to the individuals in front of them. They may not be sympathetic to the activity, that will depend upon their own assessment of what has gone on and also their own moral norms, but they may be sympathetic to the individual and may refuse to send the person to prison may impose a suspended sentence or just a fine because of that hesitancy. And arguably that existed in the United States for numerous years. It was only in the mid-1980s after you had the creation of mandatory sentencing guidelines that you saw individuals going to prison as felons under the Sherman Act. So the judges were effectively forced to send people to prison once the jury had found that they had engaged in the activity or they had admitted guilt under a plea bargain. Now, interestingly, in the United States, in the mid-90s, you have the Supreme Court determining that those sentencing guidelines, which were mandatory, were unconstitutional. But by that point, it didn't matter because you already had gotten over the uh, judicial hesitancy. People were going to prison. Judges were getting comfortable with that idea. You had a creation of a moral norm against cartel activity in society, arguably. And therefore, um, they had benefited from this uh, unlawful or unconstitutional arrangement. So you could have sentencing guidelines. In Ireland, we have seen that judges have been refusing to send people to prison. We have a criminal enforcement regime in Ireland. They could go to prison for up to 10 years. There have been numerous suspended sentences. Some judges have said, it's coming, imprisonment is coming for the next generation, but it hasn't happened yet. And what has happened is that the legislature has potentially signaled to the judiciary to get tougher. In Ireland, 
up until 2012, the maximum sentence was five years. And as I said, no one went to prison. They got suspended sentences. After 2012, we have this uh, change in the law. And what happens? It goes from five years to 10 years. So one can interpret that as a signal from the uh, legislature to the judiciary to start getting serious about this activity. But there was a reason for the change. It was to do with the IMF bailout and what have you and strengthening the deterrent effect of the cartel regime. But the point is, how do you strengthen it? Well, you strengthen it by having criminal sanctions being more effective, by sending people to prison. So it's potentially a signaling from one to the other. Will it work? Well, we'll see. OK, I hope everybody's still with me. I haven't put anybody off to sleep or anything. We're on to our next uh, problem. And then we'll, we'll move on to the second part of the presentation where I'll look at the United Kingdom. Yeah. Yeah. They weren't the individual. Well, I think. Um, the women involved were predicting that you would have a higher um, uh, sanction. So the idea was that it was, it was gender. I mean, there were a number of, of different uh, features that were uh, highlighted, and that was, for me, one of the more interesting ones. Uh, normative appraisal was also very interesting, but indeed, uh, gender had an impact upon how people assessed what the actual outcome would be if you engaged in that activity, which was, which was quite interesting. But these are surveys. I mean, they have their limitations, of course. OK, so let's get back to morality. Now, the point here is that we're talking about criminal law. Now, I'm not saying to you every criminal offence captures immoral behaviour. And I'm not saying to you that every immoral behaviour should be criminalised. I'm not saying to you lying to your best friend should be criminalised. I'm not saying committing adultery should be criminalised. I'm not saying to you prostitution should be criminalised if people find that's immoral. But what I'm saying is if we ignore morality completely in this debate, we're either going to create problems or we're missing out on advantages that we can actually uh, create. So if we ignore morality, there are problems in terms of unfairly labeling individuals. Okay? Now, we've seen the development of regulatory crime since the 1930s in particular. We've seen in the UK, for example, thousands of crimes being created in this context over the years. Okay. This statement from Sayer, I'll put on the board there, is from the 1930s, but I think it still has some relevance. He states, when the law begins to permit convictions for serious offences of men who are morally innocent and free from fault, who may even be respected and useful members of the community, its restraining power becomes undermined. So the idea here is that if you're unfairly calling someone a criminal, people start to question what it means to be criminal. It changes their attitudes. And that changes their view of the legitimacy of criminal law. Now, I'm not saying to you one criminal offence, cartel offence, that doesn't line up with morality is going to cause that effect. Of course not. But by having such an offence in a context where you have many, many other regulatory offences without any sort of link with morality, you're adding to the problem of overcriminalization potentially. Now, of course, some people might say, well, you learn from the criminal law so you can actually criminalise this behaviour and teach people, school children, that this is wrong and shouldn't be engaged in if you become a business, business person. Okay, fine. But if you rely upon criminal law all the time to educate people, it undermines its whole objective. So you don't want to over-rely upon it. And of course, there are limits here. It depends on the norms in society. They might be sticky. They may not change even if criminal law requires it. Okay, now that will depend, of course, on the society itself their understanding of cartel activity and how that sort of activity lines up with their moral norms. Well, I could give you the example, I mean, the obvious example would be the United States in the 1920s trying to prohibit alcohol. Didn't go down so well because people didn't see it as being wrong. They wanted to consume alcohol and the whole project was undermined. Okay, so there are sticky norms. Now, whether they exist with cartel activity is open to debate. What I have done is looked at this idea in the literature, and it's one of the publications that I'm, uh, I wouldn't say most proud of, but certainly happiest with. And it's a publication that I created for the Oxford Journal of Legal Studies, where I looked at the morality, the moral wrongfulness in particular of cartel activity. Now we can see up to that point, there was relatively scant treatment of the issue. 
in the literature. Not many people had analyzed it in any great detail. We had uh, Richard Wish in his book stating that it could be fraud, but not giving much more than that. We had someone like Joel Klein saying it's theft by well-dressed thieves. We had some assumptions that it's criminal in some of the literature, uh, criminal in, in, in nature. Uh, but there was no real analysis of it. So what I did was I took a framework from an American criminologist, Stuart Green, and I used that framework to analyze the morality of cartel activity. And what he did was he said, you can look at the morality of some activity by investigating the culpability of the individuals who engage in it. Do they do it negligently or by accident? Or do they do it intentionally or recklessly, et cetera? So the, the, the culpability, the mental state is important. The social harmfulness is important. Does it damage an interest that we all like in society that we want to protect, like the free market, perhaps, for cartels? And is it morally wrongful? Now, what he looked at in terms of morally wrongful was whether activity would violate a moral norm that we all accept. There are different ways of looking at moral wrongfulness. Does it violate people's rights, for example? People might say, that's wrong. If you have a right and it's violated, then we have a moral issue. What he focused on were a number of things. I didn't look at all of them, but I looked at some of the most important ones for cartel activity. Cheating, deception, or stealing. I'm not going to go through all of those now. I'm going to just give you a flavor of stealing. And when I look at the UK in a, in a few moments, we'll bring deception back into, uh, into play. But basically what he's saying is we can use already established norms that we all accept to analyze cartel activity. And what if cartel activity is indeed like theft? Or what if it is indeed like cheating in a game? What if it is indeed like deception, being misled intentionally? Should we then think about it in a different way than we might have initially when we really understand cartels? We might have a different intuitive reaction to it once we really understand its nature and how it lines up with our norms. Not many people here would disagree with the fact that we have norms in society, whether it's Ireland, where I come from, or the UK, where I live, or Latvia, where you all live, um, we all have these norms against stealing, against cheating, against being misled. So they aren't difficult to accept. The question is whether cartel activity actually fits within them. Okay, so let's just look at stealing, and then I'll finish up this part of the presentation. I'm not taking a definition from the, le from the legislation. I'm not looking at the theft acts in the UK, for example. I'm taking a statement here from moral philosophy. This is a general idea of stealing. You know, your six-year-old child might say you know, that someone stole something from them or took something from them, and they might be annoyed by that and they say it's unfair. Now, they won't use this sophisticated language, but they'll get the same idea here, I think. That's my thing that someone took, and they won't give it back. So what we can do with that is talk about an intentional and fundamental violation of another's rights of ownership in something that's capable of being bought or sold. So somebody takes your thing and holds on to it. That's stealing. Okay? Obviously, if you have your consent, that's a different thing, but we're not talking about that. Okay, so if we look at that concept and cartel activity, do they line up? Well, I think it's difficult, particularly this rights of ownership. So I'm going to break it down. Something that's capable of being bought or sold, that's fairly straightforward. We're talking about an overcharge, that's extra money, you can buy money, or you can look at it a different way for the money that you pay for the goods, you're getting fewer goods. So those extra goods you would have had, they can be bought or sold. That's not difficult. The intentional and fundamental violation, that's pretty straightforward as well. What happens, the cartelist keeps the overcharge, doesn't you know, treat it as a loan and pay you interest and then pay it back to you, keeps the overcharge and it disappears out of your pocket for good. So it's gone, it's an intentional violation. But what about the rights of ownership? Do customers, consumers, have the right of ownership to that overcharge? That's a difficulty. You could say yes, but why? And the point here is that we could say maybe that right exists because we all these days accept the free market and that implies competition and that implies a competitive price. Anything outside that competitive price um, you know, is a violation of their rights of ownership. Now that might be going too far. It might be seen as a little bit nebulous. We might say we use the civil law first this isn't a bootstraps argument. We're not talking about criminal law and then having this stealing. We're talking about the civil law. So we use competition law for a number of years in our jurisdiction. And that creates the right of ownership of customers to the competitive price so that they, when they're charged extra, they're, they are actually being taken from. Okay, they're, they're, they're suffering. 
because their rights of ownership have been violated. Now, I'm not saying that's realistic, but certainly if you want to go down that route, you will have to establish a consumer welfare standard, a true consumer welfare standard, not a total welfare standard. So the idea here is that the link between cartel activity and stealing may depend upon your competition regime and a standard employed in that regime to determine whether something is anti-competitive or acceptable. Okay, so is consumer welfare part of your uh, regime? Now, there is, even if we could accept that, maybe it is part of your regime. Maybe people say it shouldn't be. Whatever, there's a debate there. But moving on from that, problems remain. Something that is an intentional and fundamental violation. Where is that violation if you don't have implementation of the cartel? You just have an agreement between two people, let's say, two undertakings. But it's not adhered to. Someone cheats. The other party finds out, cartel falls apart. The original understanding between them, a meeting of the minds, is unlawful under EU law, irrespective of whether they act on it. So the point is that if we're going to criminalize and try to link up with stealing, that situation wouldn't be covered. That might be an attempt at cartel activity under the criminal law, but that would require additional things under the criminal law like preparatory acts and intention and whatever, fine, that will depend on your regime. But it wouldn't be an actual completed offence. You would need to ensure implementation of the offence, of the agreement, I should say. Okay, so you can see that there's just, you know, not perfect alignment here. It depends on engineering, having your consumer welfare standard, but also reducing the scope of the offence so you only capture implemented cartel activity so that you have a violation and therefore stealing. Okay, as I said, I could look at cheating or, and more importantly, deception, but I will look at deception later. Okay, so for this part then, we looked at the central question whether cartel criminalization was a sensible policy choice. And I believe it's not as clear cut as some assume. I think there are definitely advantages to it, and there is a possibility that it's quite effective. But there are drawbacks to the pro criminalization argument. There are many others I could add, but. Um, the ones I wanted to focus on here is rationality. So rationality is assumed. Is there empirical evidence for it? Not so much. Maybe um, it's not so problematic in this context to others, but nonetheless, it's a weakness. The most difficult aspect, I believe, is showing that criminalization, cartel criminalization, is an efficient response to the problem as opposed to an effective one. And that just cannot be answered to the level we would want if we were scientists. And finally, morality is often ignored. Okay, we might start with something that's harmful. Cartels are harmful, let's criminalize. That's a part of morality, the, the social harmfulness. But morality is broader than that, it includes culpability. You might capture that in the mens rea, the mental aspect of the crime. But what about the moral wrongfulness? Does it line up with our norms that we agree to as society? Questionable. We can try and make it line up to it and restrict the definition of the offense. As, as, as I will show now, that's what happened in the UK. It hasn't been very successful, um, but we will, we will see. <clears throat> okay, so I'm at the halfway point, really, in terms of my presentation. I feel like the climber who's gone up to the top of Everest and now has to, has to come back down. Okay, so. In terms of the aims, I've got two aims here. I want to examine critically the recent reform of the UK cartel offence. And in doing that, hopefully we can learn some lessons about what to do and what not to do in other jurisdictions. So it's not just relevant for UK scholars, let's say, but it could be relevant to anybody here in the room who wants to advocate for the introduction of criminal sanctions in Latvia or in any other jurisdiction in Europe, because I think there are certain things to learn from the UK approach, in particular, how we might design it such that, criminal offence, such that it lines up morality and also takes care of potential problem with legitimate cartels. That over-criminalization aspect that I alluded to in the first part of the presentation, if we just, for example, were to criminalize the definition from the OECD's recommendation, we might be going too far because we're not, for example, allowing for an Article 101.3 of the Treaty on the, European, the Functioning of the European Union 
type exception. So how do we deal with that situation? Well, I think we can learn from the UK. Okay, so I've got 45 minutes um, for this. That's, that'll be fine. So I'm going to give you some introductory comments so you understand the context to criminalization in the UK. Then I'm going to take you through the reform, so what the law was before and how it changed, and then I'm going to talk to you about some of the merits and demerits of that particular reform before giving you some final comments and then opening it up to discussion. Okay, so in line with the rest of Europe, traditionally the enforcement of competition law in the UK has been non-criminal in nature. Okay, and we can see that reflected in its Competition Act of 1998, which is still in force. You have new pieces of legislation since then, in particular uh, the Enterprise Act, uh, but nonetheless the Competition Act is still in place. It includes the regime for administrative fines on undertakings and includes the prohibitions on cartels and on um, unilateral behaviour. It doesn't include the criminal offence. That's in a different piece of legislation. Okay. Now, I should say... Technically, there was a criminal offence of conspiracy to defraud that could potentially capture cartel activity, but it would need to be deceptive cartel activity where there was a positive aspect to it, so you would be effectively uh, writing false statements to your customers, for example, to, um, to be captured by that. Uh, that's never been prosecuted, um, but nonetheless, it's never been prosecuted in that particular context with cartels uh, successfully. Okay, so putting that aside, in 2003, on the 20th of June, we have a new criminal offence coming into force, the cartel offence, and it changes the situation. Okay, It's contained within Section 188 of the Enterprise Act, 2002. It has changed slightly since then. I'll get to that in a second. But originally, what it provided was the following, that an individual is guilty of the criminal cartel offence if he dishonestly, dishonestly agrees with another to make or implement or cause to be made or implemented a cartel arrangement between horizontal competitors. So we have no vertical aspect to it, it's horizontal, it's in the same level of the market. We have a cartel arrangement, no surprise there given that it's a cartel offence, and we have this aspect of dishonesty. I'll get back to dishonesty in a second. In terms of the cartel arrangement, we're talking here about price fixing, sharing the market, uh, output restrictions, or bid rigging. Okay, so this hardcore cartel activity. Now, there are a number of reasons why dishonesty was included within the offence. Okay, so you have to prove dishonesty on behalf of the individual charged. It was included to underline the seriousness of the behaviour. It was also done to avoid any need to look at the exception under Article 1013 or its equivalent in national law under the Competition Act. Okay, so they wanted to avoid having to look at economic evidence. So they brought in dishonesty, and the idea would be, well, it may not be dishonest if it fulfills the criteria in those exception aspects of the regime. Now, that's a contradiction in terms, in my view. They don't want to bring in economic evidence because that will confuse the jury or the decision maker. And the criminal court may not be the appropriate place to judge that sort of economic evidence. So they bring in dishonesty. But dishonesty will require an analysis of the potential benefits of the activity in an economic sense. If someone brings them forward and says it's not dishonest because it would have fulfilled the exception requirements under the Competition Act. So one of the reasons for bringing it in isn't really valid. Okay, and we'll get back to that. Here's a better way of doing it to, to ensure that you don't have overcriminalization and that you have an exception type defense without actually requiring your decision maker to engage with that evidence. And the idea there is that you publish the agreement, but I'll get to that. Okay, so dishonesty is what I want to focus on for a moment. Now, dishonesty exists in English law. It's part of the definition of theft in English law, and it has a particular meaning. And that meaning applies to the cartel offence as well. So there was a case that established that dishonesty in this context is the same as dishonesty under the theft acts. Now, what does it mean? Well, there's no actual definition of dishonesty. They use the word dishonest in an attempted definition. So something is dishonest if it is dishonest according to the standards of ordinary people. 
Okay, and the defendant knew it was so dishonest. In other words, the defendant knew that ordinary people in society would think it was dishonest. The reasonable people in society would think it's dishonest. Okay, so it doesn't actually define what it means, the Gauche test. It just gives you a statement that includes the word dishonest. But there are two aspects to it, and that's important. The first one is that it must be dishonest according to the ordinary standards of reasonable people. And two, the subjective assessment, the defendant must know it's dishonest according to those standards. Now, if the defendant genuinely believes, according to him or her, that it's not dishonest for his or her standards, it doesn't matter. What matters is the standards of people in society in general. Okay? All right. Now, I'll show you how that's problematic in a few moments. In terms of the custodial sentence, we're talking about five years here. In the United States, it's, it's higher, it's 10 years. Ireland's 10 years. You have 12 years in Canada. Um, you have seven in Chile. So there's a whole number of different sort of uh, maximums across the, the globe. The reason they chose five years at the time in the UK was to give them certain powers. If it would have a maximum of at least five years imprisonment, it would be called an arrestable offence under UK law, and therefore certain powers would accrue, for example, being able to wiretap which wouldn't be available otherwise. Okay. Now, why did they introduce it? Well, the central idea here was deterrence. So we can go back to statements in the House of Commons, for example, from Patricia Hewitt, MP, who was then the, the politician that was responsible for the bill that would contain criminal sanctions. She stated, we regard forming cartels as very serious offences, and the threat of imprisonment is important to deterring them. So there was a clear message here in terms of deterrence. In fact, the initial report that advocated in favor of criminalization that eventually led to the adoption of criminal sanctions in the UK put forward a model very similar to the one that I actually explained earlier. So we're talking here again about criminal sanctions being the most meaningful deterrent to antitrust violations and sending out messages to business executives that would not otherwise uh, be sent out. And again, we could go through that whole argument. I won't, I won't do that. But the point is that it's the same argument that's being made. So we're talking about non-indemnifiable sanction on the individual to take care of the deterrence gap because you cannot impose an optimal fine on the company. OK. Now, of course, to have deterrence, you need to have enforcement. If a law exists and is never enforced, no one's going to take it seriously. So you need to have a certain degree of enforcement so people take it seriously, and also you need to remind people it's there so that they do take it seriously at any given point. Okay, so how many do we need in any given year? Well, there was a report that was created for the Office of Fair Trading called the Hammond Penrose Report. It has its limitations, um, but nonetheless, it stated that we're talking about six prosecutions a year. That's what we should really have, six decent prosecutions of the cartel offence each year in order to have an effective regime. I mean, that's sort of pulled out of the air, fine, but it's not talking about 600, it's talking about six, okay? Maybe we might even say one very big case a year that is successful. Now, it came into effect the 20th of June 2003, and we can see in 2011, by that stage, the enforcers are unhappy with the regime, there is a process in foot which is to do with changing the competition regime as a whole. As part of that, criminalization will be looked at. So this period is important. We're going to look at 2003 to 2011 before we have the reform start. How many successful prosecutions did we have? Well, we had two. Now, that, I'm not saying two individuals went to prison. In fact, uh, we have three individuals by this point. But we had two cases, two different cartels. Now, one was successful, so the defendants pleaded guilty. The other was a disaster. I'll explain briefly. The first one was successful because the individuals involved were involved in an international cartel. Three of them, UK citizens, were arrested in the United States. They were going to go to prison in the United States. There was evidence against them. They entered a plea arrangement with the United States prosecutors. Now, the United States was probably keen to ensure that the UK would start to get a bit more robust with its criminal enforcement, so that's maybe the incentive they had. But the US uh, plea arrangement allowed for the following. It allowed for the three individuals to go back to the United Kingdom. They would waive the right to contest extradition if they served any more time 
sorry, any less time in the, in the United Kingdom than they would have done in the United States. And they would plead guilty to the cartel offence in the UK. So effectively, here's what was facing the three British uh, individuals. You will go to prison, let's say, for three years each in the United States. However, to avoid that, you can go back to the United Kingdom, plead guilty to the cartel offence, and if you serve three years there, you won't be expected to come back. But if you don't plead guilty, we'll extradite you, and you've already agreed that you'll come. If you serve any less than th time than, than two and a half, three years, whatever it was, there were different uh, sentences for each of the three, uh, you will actually come back as well, and you won't be able to contest it. So this is a very unusual arrangement that was entered into. So of course, not wanting to spend time in the US prison, they come back to the United Kingdom, they all plead guilty, and interestingly enough, they get a sentence, each of them get a different sentence, but they get a sentence effectively for each one of them that is a little bit more than the sentence they would have served in the United States. So what they do is they appeal. Each and every one of them appeals. However, they're not appealing for the sentence to go all the way down to zero, like you might want to do ordinarily. They're not appealing anything else. They're just appealing the sentence so that it comes down right down to what they would have to serve in the United States. So the judge allows the appeal, finds herself in the unusual position of saying the following, that in fact, if they had argued for a reduction, even more of a reduction, they would have probably gotten it. But since they haven't argued for it, we're not going to be able to give it to them. Now they're happy because they're not going to have to go back to the United States. We're in this sort of strange situation where a judge is happy to reduce the sentence, but doesn't do so because it's not argued. Okay. Right, so that's a very unusual situation. That's the Marine Hoses case. And that's really the only successful prosecution we've had ever under the cartel offence. Now, there is another one where people pleaded guilty, okay, but, um, but this uh, was one where people actually went to prison. And I'll show you the cases in a second. Okay, now, the other one, sorry, I should go back. The other one was a disaster. We were all, as academics, looking at this situation, we were waiting for this case to come before the courts. It was the BA case, there was uh, price fixing on, on fuel surcharges with Virgin Airlines, and we wanted to see how this would play out in front of a jury. Would the jury convict? Would they find that this was dishonest behavior? That's an interesting question we're waiting to have answered. What happens is on the very first day, the OFT, the Office of Fair Trading, didn't offer any evidence. They basically stood up and said, we're not offering evidence, case closed. So, why? Well, they had made a mistake. They hadn't disclosed all the information that they were supposed to disclose. Okay, now they made a mistake, they were incompetent, let's say, and they learned from that mistake, but they should have disclosed more to uh, the other side, and in particular it was to do with uh, emails that they believed were um, not accessible. Okay, so anyway, that's the context. But by 2011, we have the OFT, uh, and now, which is obviously the, the Competition Markets Authority, arguing that this low level of enforcement uh, was due to, in particular, the definition of dishonesty and that it should go, and that it's too difficult in practice to actually prosecute in this context. So they advocated its removal, and luckily enough for them, there was a reform process that was initiated in 2011 that provided some scope for this reform. Now that consultation process was wider than the criminal offence, and I'll explain it in a second, it's wider than the criminal offence, and it looked at the competition uh, regime as a whole in the UK, looking at mergers, for example, and, and other things, but it gave the scope for a change in the criminal law. So this is what I've created uh, in terms of the UK's record to date. There may well be ongoing cases that I'm not aware of, but you can see on the bottom there, the Marine Hoses case, where we have three individuals being prosecuted, three being convicted, and we have sentences of two and a half years, two years and 20 months being served, that's what they would have faced in the United States. Uh, so total time served for everybody uh, was 74 months, and that's it. And we can see in other cases you have the BA case, which comes next and starting at the bottom, moving up to the air passenger fuel surcharge case, four individuals prosecuted, none convicted. They didn't actually go forward to prosecution, offered no evidence because of disclosure issues, so nothing happens there in terms of a conviction. And there are other cases that were potentials, but we had no uh, charges being brought. And then we had the galvanized steel water tanks, which is second from the top. Three individuals prosecuted. This was interesting, actually. We had one convicted because he uh, pleaded guilty, and he got six months. The other two parties didn't plead, and they were acquitted. So they were acquitted by the jury. The jury had to look at dishonesty, and they determined that the offence wasn't made out, 
more likely than not because it wasn't, in their view, dishonest. So they walked, whereas the individual who pleaded guilty got six months. Now we can see there's an outstanding case here. A person has been convicted. We don't know what's going to happen next with it in terms of the sentence. As far as I'm aware, uh, that hasn't yet been decided. So it's a pretty low level of enforcement, really. If I compare this to the United States, you'll see people going to prison very, very regularly each and every year in the United States. It's gone down a little bit in the last year or two, but it's probably going to go back up again. We can see they're completely dedicated to it in the United States. The Yates memo, for example, has, has made that particularly clear. Okay, so let's get back to the UK. So in terms of process and this consultation, a consultation document is published in March 2011 and it has a number of chapters, but one of the chapters looks at the cartel offence and how it might be reformed. Now, there are four options put forward at this stage. All of them involve getting rid of dishonesty. So there's an acknowledgement that dishonesty is problematic, so they're going to get rid of it. But if they get rid of it, the way the actual offence is defined will be too broad. For example, what if you could argue that the cartel would fulfil the criteria in 101.3, the exception type criteria under EU competition law? Well, that's pretty rare, but let's assume it's, it, it happens. Well, that would still be criminal, because if you get rid of dishonesty, there's nothing to take care of that situation, apart from the prosecutor deciding not to prosecute. So getting rid of dishonesty, although it's a good idea, would ensure that the offence is too broad. So we need to do something in addition to that. So there were a number of options put forward, as I said. The first one, they talked about prosecutorial guidelines. So get rid of dishonesty and have a document created by the prosecutor that states situations in which it would not seek um, a prosecution. I mean, that has issues to do with legal certainty and it's legally questionable if you can change the, you know, how you can change the law through prosecutorial guidelines. You need to be able to tell from the actual offence itself with judgments from the court what would be covered. So I think that was up against issues to do with legal certainty. Not a great idea. The second option was to have a list of agreements that would be okay. They wouldn't be defined by their economic impact. So that would avoid economic evidence going in front of a jury, which would be confused. But they would be defined by their type. So sort of creating like a joint venture exception, for example. Types of agreements by their nature rather than their effect. But that then obviously brings questions of which ones would we pick and how would we define them and then there'll be a whole lot of litigation about whether this offence fits within these white lists or not. So that wasn't particularly helpful in my view. So there are two options left. Get rid of dishonesty and prove secrecy, active secrecy, that someone had done something to keep the cartel secret. That's difficult, though, because fine, there might be situations where they keep it secret in the sense that they lie. Maybe they sign documents in a public procurement process saying this isn't subject to collusion. Um, there might be instances of that, but that's quite difficult, I think, to prosecute, and it might be narrowing it far too much. The other option, final option, option four, which they went with, and which I thought they should go with, was to get rid of dishonesty and have a carve-out have a situation where a criminal offence would not be committed. That situation would be where the agreement was made openly. Now, I'll get back to what that means in a few moments, okay? So what happened? Well, the government responded, so it created a document explaining the consultation, explaining the responses, some of them at least, and then explaining what it was going to do. And for the criminal regime, it decided to go with option four, get rid of dishonesty and allow for a carve-out of agreements that were made openly. Now, they said there was, you know, some support for this position. In fact, there were 115 responses to the consultation, and we can see that 49 of them commented on the cartel offence. 33 of those said, leave dishonesty alone. They wanted to see it work in practice first, most of them. And some of them just thought it was a good idea in principle to separate out, you know, the, the criminal regime from the civil regime or to underline the seriousness of the activity. Okay, so 16 responses said we should do something, but only three actually advocated the adoption of option four. One was the OFT itself, now the CMA, so the Competition Authority. The other was myself, and the other was the Competition um, Center where I was based. They put in a response as well, so there wasn't exactly too much support for the position, but the position was adopted. And we have a piece of legislation that goes through the House of Commons and into the Lords, and it's adopted, and it's given royal assent, so it becomes part of law, 25th of April 2013. Now, 
It contains option four, and I'll explain in more detail what that actually means. But it also contained additional things in, in the offense, and one of which I really think is a very bad idea. And I'll explain in a second. Okay, so these provisions, the cartel provisions, come into effect on the 1st of April 2014. So any cartel that's discovered, let's say, and it relates to 20th of June 2003, um, but is finished, let's say, by the 1st of April 2014, that will be under the old law. We'll have to prove dishonesty. Any cartel after the 1st of April 2014 is under the new law. So the old law still exists, but only for that period, 20th of June 2003 to the 1st of April 2014. Okay, so what do we have? Dishonesty goes. No longer need to prove dishonesty and the difficulties with demonstrating that uh, ordinary, pe reasonable people in society would think it was dishonest. There was a carve out of agreements made openly. So these are situations within which criminal offence will not be committed. We have notification. So where customers are given the information prior to sale, systematically. Or with bid rigging, where we have the person requesting the bid being informed when the bids are submitted, that it's actually su submitted uh, using a collusive procedure. So that's notification. And probably even more importantly, we have publication. So here we have relevant information which is published in a specified manner before implementation. So what does all this mean? Well, relevant information, we're talking about the names of the parties, names of the undertakings, the market involved, and also why they think it might be a type of arrangement that would fall within the cartel offence. So there needs to be an explanation as to why this is a cartel effectively. Now in terms of the specified manner, that has been specified in an order and we're talking about it being published in either the Belfast Gazette, the Edinburgh Gazette or the London Gazette. So it's a legal magazine that contains notices, let's say about bankruptcy and things like that. So you can take an advertisement effectively out in the uh, London Gazette and explain the names of the parties and the market and why you think your arrangement is a cartel and that will ensure that it's not criminal. It doesn't mean they get no uh, administrative procedure following. If it's unlawful, that may well occur. It doesn't stop it from occurring, but they will not be criminal. And I think that's a good idea. Now, in terms of the additional defenses here that were brought forward, <clears throat> the first two following, that the individual did not intend the nature of the agreement to be concealed from customers. So you have to prove a negative, uh, or did not intend the nature of it to be concealed from the competition authority. Happy enough with those. I don't think they're too problematic. But the final one, that the individual took reasonable steps to disclose the nature of agreements to lawyers in order to get advice prior to making or implementing the agreement is a bad thing. Okay? I'll explain that at the end of the presentation. Um, and I'll give you the actual wording of the legislation so you can see that I'm not exaggerating in terms of how badly construed or created this, uh, this particular piece is. Okay, so what we must consider then is whether removing dishonesty is good or bad. I think it's good. I don't think we need it. The carve-out of agreements made openly, so those due to publication or notification, I think they're good too. We should do that. It should stop there, though, because the additional defences, at least one of them anyway, is a very bad idea. So in terms of insights to others outside the United Kingdom, including Latvian audience, I would say that we can learn. From, you can learn from this. I think if you wanted to create an offence that um, has potential to work, that links up with morality and takes care of uh, legitimate cartels if they arise. This is a good way of doing it, but I wouldn't advocate the defences. Dishonesty is a sort of common law construct anyway. You probably wouldn't be considering that in your offence, but the carve-out aspect is very good in my view. Okay, and I have an article that I've published on this. I'm happy to send it to anybody if you want to, to read it or quote from it uh, or use it in any way, so please do get in touch if that's the case. Okay. <clears throat> So let's go to the first point here in terms of evaluating the merits or demerits of the reform. I argue it's a good idea to remove dishonesty. Now the point here is that you have a sort of chicken and egg problem. You don't really have hardened attitudes in the UK, or at least when it was introduced you didn't, regarding cartel activity. So you want to introduce the criminal offence to harden attitudes, to, to change people's views, okay? to make them self-enforce even if we're talking about business people. Okay. So the aim here is to ensure that you have self-enforcement through internalization of the norms and therefore reduction in cost. 
But the problem is that you have this gauche test, this idea that dishonesty needs to be proven. So why is that a problem? Well, because it actually presupposes the hardened attitudes you're trying to create. So you want to create hardened attitudes to cartel activity using the criminal law, but in order to do so, you already have to have those in place. So it's a chicken and egg style problem, if you will. And why is that? Well, it's because of the objective aspect of the Gauche test. You have to demonstrate as a prosecutor that the defendant's actions were dishonest according to the ordinary standards of reasonable and honest people, to use the full test. Okay, so it does depend on a norm that is already out there. And this is, this is difficult. And there has been a little bit of survey evidence put forward in this context. For example, the survey of the Centre for Competition Policy, where I was uh, based for a number of years, uh, found uh, that 60% of individuals who were surveyed believed cartels to be dishonest. Some have said that's high enough. Others have said it's pretty low. Irrespective of that, only 10% thought that imprisonment was the direct sanction. Okay, so 10% is quite low, I would think, if the survey is representative. And people might nullify the law if they think that people shouldn't go to prison, even if they've committed an offence. So if you have a jury that's looking at activity and evidence, and they might come to the conclusion, yes, a criminal offence was committed, they might think that imprisonment is not warranted and might just acquit anyway. And as an academic, it will be a criminal offence for me to go and interview the jurors and ask them why they actually decided the way they decided. Okay, that would be contempt of court. So that, um, that would be problematic. Okay, so this is the point that the dishonesty element short circuits the effect of operation. Now, there are other problems with it too. Even if we could establish that there is a genuine moral norm against cartel activity in the UK at any given time against cartels, fine, we have that. The problem is, is that when you have dishonesty, it opens up all sorts of arguments here. For example, saying, well, yes, I was engaging in cartel activity and I was hiding the prices, uh, the, the, sorry, the fact of that from customers, but I have a small business, I have employees, they have um, salaries uh, to, uh, that they expect from the business. If we go out of business, they're going to be damaged, their families are going to be damaged. That's all I cared about, which is keeping the business alive, etc., etc. So it's not dishonest, it might be technically unlawful, but I didn't believe it was dishonest. I thought ordinary people would accept what I'm doing, because they would do the same. Right? Those sorts of arguments can come in if you use dishonesty as part of your offence. If you get rid of dishonesty, they become irrelevant. They might come into play in terms of mitigation, trying to argue for a reduction in your sentence maybe. Okay, but in terms of a substantive offence, they're not relevant. They're also irrelevant, of course, when you look at Article 101 uh, of the Treaty of the Functioning European Union. They don't look at those, those sorts of things. They look at the criteria 1013, if you have a cartel that fits within 1011. And it doesn't talk about these sorts of things clearly. So if you're trying to be consistent between, have consistency between the criminal offence and your uh, offence in EU law, then you shouldn't be considering these things. Now, of course, you can talk about intention or negligence when you're looking at the fine because they have to be present when the fine's being imposed at EU level. Um, but nonetheless, the point here is that um, dishonesty brings in defences you don't want. Okay. Now, a second good point here is to do with the use of the notification or publication carve The idea that agreement is made openly. And I think the first point uh, in that context is the following, that it provides a good way to deal with legitimate cartel activity. Let's assume that there are some very, very, very rare occasions where an agreement that could fit within the definition of your cartel is price fixing or something, or it's, it's, it's a reduction in output, let's say but it would fulfill the criteria under your exemption aspect of your regime, so under 101.3, let's say at EU level, or if it's being enforced in the national member states. Well, what do you do in terms of the criminalization of that activity? How do you ensure it's not part of the offence? Well, you could use our, those sorts of criteria as, as defences, but that then brings with it the difficulty of courts or juries trying to decide on that, and the court, the jury may not have the competence, the institutional competence or uh, abilities to, to really understand that evidence. And they might be misled by clever uh, defense attorneys 
And you know, you want to avoid that sort of situation. So what you can do is allow for the publication or notification of your agreement to ensure no criminality. And if the individuals have created a cartel, but are not doing so you know, to engage in some sort of criminal conspiracy, they're doing it because they think it's beneficial to society on the whole and would pass muster under EU competition law or under national competition law when it's not the criminal offence at issue, well, then all they have to do is publish the arrangement or notify it, and there's no criminal sanctions, and if they're correct about their assessment, there's going to be no administrative punishment either. Now, if they're incorrect, well, so be it. But that's the situation anyway, because your self-assessment is part of your competition regime under the civil uh, approach. So I think this is a good way of dealing with it. And it avoids you know, presenting economic evidence to decision makers that are not able to deal with it. Now, some might argue, well, then that will just give potential to undermine the whole regime. So you enter into a cartel, just publish it, and you don't go to prison. Great, but it's not going to work like that. Because if it is a genuine criminal conspiracy, they'll want to keep it secret. They'll want to keep it secret from their customers. They'll want to keep it secret from the authorities so they don't go after it in the administrative setting. So they won't publish them routinely. They'll only publish those ones that are genuinely felt to fall within the exception. Okay, so that's the, the way of carving out that sort of exception without requiring a consideration of the economic evidence. All you look at is whether it's been notified or whether it's been published. Now also, I yeah, said that point. Also, if in fact we find that some cartelists, for whatever reason, decide to routinely publish the arrangement because they don't want to go to prison and they don't care about the administrative regime, let's say, well, this might actually lead to an increase in deterrence because then you'll actually find out about the cartel, which would otherwise be secret, and you could go after it with the administrative sanctions. And would in fact reduce the need for criminal sanctions because the need for criminal sanctions came from a very high optimal fine, which required, you know, which, which assessed the probability of detection. Well, if your detection here is approaching, you know, 100% because they published them routinely, then your optimal fine doesn't need to be so high. Okay, so I think this is not really that valid. It's a good way of dealing with legitimate cartel activity. Okay, I'm nearing the end of the presentation, so please do bear with me. I'm going to look at immoral behavior and its link through this uh, exception, sorry, this um, publication notification carve out. I'll look at the defenses brief briefly and then I'll finish. I'll try to answer questions if I can still speak. <coughs> okay, so in terms of the carve out of these agreements made openly, I think it's a good idea because it lines the criminalized cartel activity, that activity that is a cartel but is not published or notified, with deceptive behavior, with deception. So what is deception? Well, if we look at the philosophical discussions, we might come to the following conclusion, that deception occurs where a person communicates a message with the intent to cause someone to believe something that's not true, in other words, to mislead them, and that person is led to believe the untruth. So that person is misled. So we have a message that's communicated. As a result of that message, um, we have someone who uh, believes something that's untrue and there's an intention to cause that belief. Now let's look at cartels to see if they line up with deception. There are three scenarios potentially here. The first one is where the cartelist, let's say, expressly states, I am not a cartelist. I have not engaged in cartel activity. To, you know, lies to the customer. The second is where the cartelist doesn't mention to the consumer anything, just sells the product. Here's my price, sells the product, doesn't say, I'm in a cartel, I'm not in a cartel, says nothing. And the final one is where we have the existence of the cartel revealed to the customer before um, the sale, or revealed um, publicly before the sale. Now, I, I hope you can follow me now and know where I'm going with this. This here is arguably deceptive, and I'll explain why in a second. So the first two are the cartelist lies, or the cartelist says nothing, but the other one, there's no deception. How can he be deceptive if he's revealing the existence of the cartel is the point. So let's go through that briefly. So the first scenario, we have a lie from the cartelist to the customer. Now, the intention here might well be clear that you keep the cartel secret so the authorities don't find out and you get a big fine on your company or that the customers are dissatisfied and stop buying from you. So there's, a, there's an intent, there's a, a reason why a cartelist will, will lie if he lies. Now there are probably rare examples of this. I'm sure we've all bought from a cartel at some point, whether it's a bottle of milk or whether it's you know, breakfast cereal, who knows. 
but I'm sure that it's rare indeed for you to receive that sort of communication in a shop from a retailer or indeed from a supplier if you're engaged in business. However, we might see some exceptions here. For example, where official statements are signed in the context of procurement, where they state that the bid is not subject to uh, any collusion. You might expect that. And if you were to require that as part of your procurement process and also have criminal sanctions, you know, it tightens up the regime a little bit, I would think. Second scenario is a bit more difficult. What's the message? Here's our goods. Buy them if you will. Okay. That's not a lie. That message is perfectly true. Here are our goods. We, are, we will sell them to you. But the point here is that that's not problematic because it can lead nonetheless to the belief that something uh, exists when it doesn't. How? Because consumers may, I'm not saying they do, they may, and there's a little bit of uh, survey evidence to do with this, but consumers may make the assumption that the goods they're buying are at a competitive price. They may even tell the supplier, it's a great price, well done. But they don't know the price could be even lower. All right? So there may be an assumption by the consumers that the goods are at the competitive price. Okay, now, how does that lead to uh, deception? Well, here's a statement from Lever and Pike. They changed the law with this statement. This was used in a case in the UK to change the approach to um, conspiracy to defraud, not the cartel offence. The court, court later reversed them, so don't worry about it. it. didn't last very long. But they used this point. It was published in the European Competition Law Review uh, to do so. In many situations today, third parties who deal with undertakings that are, in fact, parties to cartel agreements will proceed on the assumption that they are dealing with undertakings that are lawfully engaged in normal competition with each other, and the cartelists will know that this is so and will, in effect, act in a dishonest manner if the existence of the cartel is kept secret. They used the word dishonest because that was part of the offence, conspiracy to defraud. But we can change that to deception and it still works. So the idea here is that they make an assumption, the consumers, and the cartelist doesn't tell them you're wrong. So it all depends on whether the cartelist knows they're making that assumption. Well, they might. They might know it from customer satisfaction surveys, for example. Okay? Or just simply from the customer having a big smile on his face who's purchasing the goods. Okay? So the idea here is that you can possibly capture I'm not, I'm not saying it will always be present but you can, you can try and capture that with your offence. But this situation, situation three, is one that you need to carve out if you want to line your offence up with deception. So why don't we have deception in scenario three? Well, we have the revealing of the cartel. The customer is told about the cartel either through a public statement or a statement directly to all the customers. So there's no strong case then that there's any intention to mislead if the truth is actually laid bare. Second of all, if the customer's told the truth, then they're not going to actually be misled. They're not going to say, oh, no, 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 there, there was no cartel, you're only you're lying to me. They're giving them the painful truth, something they may not like. So they're surely going to assume that it's true. It wouldn't be in the interest of the, of the seller to lie about something that is going to be harmful to their reputation. Okay? So the idea here is that scenario three doesn't involve deception and therefore shouldn't be in the offence. That's the bottom line. Okay, so I think it's a good way of doing it. You look after your legitimate cartels, you ensure that there's a link with morality and bring the advantages with that, and also you give some legal certainty, because if you're engaging in you know, an arrangement and you're not sure whether it's criminal or not, you don't want it to be, you're not trying to be in a conspiracy to raise prices, but your, your type of agreement could fit within the offence, particularly if it's quite broadly drawn, publish it. Put a notice in the London Gazette, explain a few details about it, not too much, it doesn't involve a significant infringement of confidentiality, just a few details why it might be a cartel, and there you go, you won't go to prison. And I think that's a good way of, of operationalizing the offence. I'm not saying it's perfect in the sense that nobody's interests are trampled on, yeah, there's a little bit of that, a little bit of an infringement of confidentiality, but it's done in the public interest, and it's not too, uh, it's not too onerous in my view. Okay, so the final thing I'm going to focus on for the last five minutes are the defences. So, there were three defences, I can live with two, I don't think they're going to be that um, problematic or useful, but one of them is a very bad idea and I can't live with it. Okay, so two defences that are uh, based on a lack of intention to conceal. So there's an intention to, to con not to, <coughs> excuse me, there's a lack of intention to conceal from customers or lack of intention to conceal from the competition authority. Okay, fine, if you can prove the negative, that's great. Um, and if you do, it shows that you're not being deceptive. You've got no intention to 
conceal, so maybe you've got no intention to mislead. It sort of lines up a little bit with deception. Okay. In terms of the guidelines published by the prosecutor, the CMA in this context, uh, there's no obligation, for example, to inform the authorities of the actual um, agreement in order to be able to prove this. But if you do inform the authorities, it might be good evidence that you have no intention to deceive, no intention to conceal. Okay, this is, this is a difficult one. Have a look at this. This is actually from the law, from the legislation. It is a defense for an individual charged with an offense under section 1881 of the Enterprise Act, which is a criminal cartel offense, to show that before the making of the agreement, he or she took reasonable steps to ensure the nature of the arrangements will be disclosed to professional legal advisors for the purposes of obtaining advice about them before they're making, or as the case may be, their implementation. I'll go through that in a second. Just take that in. Prosecutor has said these professional legal advisors could be in-house or external, and in fact may even be foreign uh, lawyers, not just UK qualified lawyers. So you take reasonable steps, to go to your lawyer, to find out if the arrangements that you're contemplating would be illegal. And once you do that, irrespective of the advice that's given, you've got a defense. Okay? So you don't have to take the advice, read it. It doesn't say you have to take the advice. It just means you've got to actually take reasonable steps to get advice. So if you get the advice, and the advice is, you're on dodgy ground here, best not to do it, or in fact, this is clearly criminal, you're engaging in a criminal conspiracy, fine, thank you very much, now I've got my get out of jail free card. Why not being flippant? This is actually the law. And if we look at the prosecutorial guidelines, they don't address this issue at all, at all. They basically just repeat what's stated here and give a little bit of detail about what a professional legal advisor is, etc. And it must be a genuine effort to get advice, but it doesn't say you have to take it. Now, this, in my view, <coughs> could easily be used to short circuit the offense. So if you're an individual, you want to engage in cartel activity, Go to your own lawyer, not the company's lawyer, so that you can use your own lawyer to demonstrate the defense. And uh, he owes you the privilege uh, rather than the company at that point. So go to your own lawyer, explain what's going to happen, get the advice, and then ignore it. Okay? And then you have your, your defense in criminal law. Okay? You want to document it, you might even want you know, a letter from your lawyer saying all the things have been done, all the steps have been taken, all the information has been given, and here's the advice. Fine. Now you've got your defense. So there's no obligation here on the lawyer who's advising to inform the CMA. If he did so, or she did so, that would be a breach of privilege and this person would be disbarred. Okay? So what do we do about this? Well, some have actually called for additional words to be read into the defense. For example, I must have taken reasonable steps to comply with the act, sorry, comply with or act upon that advice. Okay, but if you actually take reasonable steps to comply with the advice, you probably won't commit the offense anyway. So why would you need a defense? It doesn't make sense to me. I mean, fine, it says reasonable steps, it doesn't say all steps, or that, you know, you must adhere to the law, but, you know, let's assume you do adhere to the law, you take the reasonable steps. Why would you need a defense? You won't have committed the cartel offense at all. So I don't see how that's going to work. But the problem here is that the judiciary needs to read that into the law. It looks like a lot of words to me. If you're changing one word to another word because there's been an evident mistake um, in, in publishing, that's one thing. But putting a whole sentence into it that changes the operation of the offence altogether is not something I think that would be done very easily. Uh, if I went through all the documents to do with this as a pass through the houses um, in, in the UK. There's, there's no discussion of the defence. They were added very late in the day with, lo with no discussion. So to find an intention that that is exactly what the, um, the legislature wanted to happen with this defence is not going to be possible. Okay. Now we can see if we look at the literature on adding words into legislation, it is possible, but it's, it's very exceptional, and I think it's not going to happen in this instance. So what can we do? Well, we could require the lawyer to inform the CMA. Okay, well then the CMA sort of gets through the veil of secrecy of the cartel and it increases its, its rate of detection. Okay, maybe. And if, we, if the cartelist knows that this will happen after he gets advice, he might actually be inclined to adhere to the advice, not to engage in the cartel. Okay, but that brings with issues to do with who should actually police the regime. 
Should the lawyers do this? It's okay if you're talking maybe about terrorist financing or you're talking about a child that's in danger or someone is about to commit a murder. Fair enough. We can see why you might want to impose those obligations of disclosure to the authorities. But in this instance, do we want to do that? I think the, the lawyers will, will, will be hesitant to take that on, to say the least. So my point is it should be just abolished. I've written that in the Modern Law Review article that I've had published. I hope in due course that the authorities will listen. They'll see it's not working and abolish it, and then I'll be able to claim a little bit of impact for my research. That's the aim. Okay, so finally, in terms of the UK cartel offence, it was all about deterrence, but it wasn't working very well. So they need to change it, particularly because it wasn't defined in the way that you would want to define it. They've made changes that are good, getting rid of dishonesty, having the carve-outs, because it lines up with immoral conduct and also allows for legitimate cartels to be taken care of. So it's a good idea. But the defences are relatively okay, the first two, but the last one is a very bad idea, should be abolished, and other jurisdictions could follow the approach of carve I think there's a good enough reason for that, but certainly shouldn't be following this particular approach regarding the defences. Okay, I'll leave it there. Okay, so the first thing you were asking there was to do with dishonesty. Why, why was it initially in the actual offence? Well, there were a number of reasons for it. I think the most important reason that was put forward was the idea to underline how serious this activity actually is in the hope that it would um, cause people to change their views about um, the criminalized uh, activity and that they would internalize the norm and that it would be part of self-enforcement. So it was to underline how serious this activity is by bringing loaded, a loaded word, dishonesty, to it. So if someone were convicted of a criminal cartel offense, they wouldn't be able to say, look, it's just a regulatory offense and has no link to morality, there's nothing wrong, it's not serious. Whereas you know, the prosecutor could say, no, we've convicted this individual here of a very serious offence that involves dishonest behaviour, you know, judged by his or her peers to be dishonest. So it, it brings this sort of moral language to bear on it, which was deemed to be useful in terms of communicating the message about tightening attitudes to cartel activity. The other reason that they wanted to underline, less important but still a reason here, was to allow for that sort of exception to occur without having to bring forward any economic evidence. So they were worried that if you had a, a defense along the lines of 1013, people would, as defendants, bring forward a whole host of economists who would say, oh, look, it's beneficial, and whole, you know, all these models, and the, the jury would just tune out and go, I don't really understand this, so we can't really convict in this situation. It's to avoid that sort of situation, okay? But the problem is, by actually having dishonesty, you allow that in through the back door because they'll come along and say, okay, it's not dishonest because it fulfills these criteria and here's all the economic evidence anyway. So that wasn't a really good idea, um, a good reason for it. So it's more about sort of underlying the seriousness of it. Um, but then, you know, you had people in the consultation process saying, it doesn't underline the seriousness of it. We're quite dishonest ourselves most of the day. You know, when your wife cooks a meal for you and it's not very nice, you say, oh, it was lovely. That's dishonest, but it's not serious. You know, it's, it's, it's a sort of normal part of, of life, being a little bit dishonest every now and then to sort of make life easier on everybody, right? So just because it's dishonest doesn't mean it's serious. You know, and I think there's, there's, there's a point to be made there. <coughs> now, you say if they have an obligation, let's say the directors or the management of the company. Well, that's true in, 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 in some respects because they have obligations to their shareholders, let's say, right? But, in the UK, you could get a director disqualification order if you're involved in the management of a company, let's say it's involved in a competition violation, there's a process that you can follow there to actually get an order that would stop that person being a director for a number of years. But of course, the person trying to seek that order would have to prove what's alleged. Uh, so there is that ability there, but there's no requirement for the director to come forward and prove that did everything he could. Um, and I think the last question you had was, was a very interesting one as well. So we've changed the law. Have we got any more convictions or has it had an impact? Unfortunately, not yet. So maybe it's early days. I mean, we're coming up on nearly four years, right? So 1st of April 2014 comes into effect, four years. We haven't seen a prosecution under it. We haven't seen a successful prosecution under it. And I think... It'll be interesting to see what happens next, but uh, possibly a good reason for them is because the defense is there. I don't have any evidence for that, it's all theoretical at this point. Um, but 
No, it hasn't had an impact in any, any, any uh, specifically good way, no. I think there's, let's assume that the United States is successful in its, its efforts here. It certainly has um, achieved very high levels of convictions of individuals, and people seem to fear the United States from the anecdotal evidence. Let's assume that. What, what does it have in its regime that makes it so effective? It has a number of things. In the early 80s, I said, they got over the judicial hesitancy by having these mandatory sentencing guidelines. Now, they were later found to be unconstitutional, but nonetheless, they used them to get over that hurdle and perhaps create some sort of moral norm. They had criminal sanctions for years at that point, but you didn't have significant terms of imprisonment being served. And so they, they had the sentencing guidelines. They also had high maximums in terms of, of, of prison sentences. So they increased over time, and they were continually increasing the maximum uh, uh, time and, and fines, um, perhaps in line with a strengthening of a competition culture. So there was that. So it took quite a bit of, of time to develop. You also have plea bargaining, which is a significant part of it. People are afraid to go to prison. They might plea bargain even if they have a good chance of getting off effectively if it goes to trial. So that's a significant part of the actual prosecution strategy to get a plea bargain. They also have a very robust, it seems to me, um, criminal immunity program. That's not only for the, cor the two programs, one for the corporate corporation, the other for the individuals. And they're, they're linked as well. If the corporate body gets it, then the individuals that work for it and continue to work for it or parts of the cartel get the immunity. So I think these sorts of things um, are, are, are very important in making it a robust sort of approach. Now, of course, the authorities are well resourced. They have, um, you know, a commitment, a serious commitment to actually prosecute these sorts of offences. Uh, that helps. In terms of tr translating that to, to somewhere like, like Latvia, well, I'm no expert on Latvia. I would like to hear your views on that. But the idea here is, is that you would need those things, I think, maybe the exception of plea bargaining, as a minimum. You would need to have judges that are prepared to send people to prison. You would need to have strong moral norms against it, however they're created, whether it's through sentencing guidelines that send people to prison and you start to create a moral norm against it, or you used to have a very strong advocacy drive that demonstrates why cartels are wrong before you start introducing criminal sanctions and, and sending people people to prison. You know, So I think if we hold up the United States as the ideal, we have to understand that there are certain things that are unique to the United States that you may not be able to have elsewhere, like grand jury investigations, for example. And all of these things feed into um, the effectiveness of the regime, if it is indeed effective. So I'm not sure we can take any or all of those things and bring them to Latvia. So I wouldn't be standing here saying, look at the United States, works well there, it should be the same here. You know, that will be for the Latvians to call, I would say. Uh, I think if you are intent on going to a criminalized regime, taking those softer approaches might be a good step initially for a start. But even if that was what you were aiming for as an end goal, taking a softer approach in criminalization but focusing on the individual, there are things that you can do. So you could, for example, impose administrative fines on the individual. And they do that as far as I'm aware in Portugal. So you could have an administrative fine imposed on the individual. That might act as a, as a sanction to that individual. And it might have a condemnatory nature to it, even though it's not a formal criminal offence that's been committed. Uh, fine. But the problem with that, of course, is always that the company may somehow be able to incentivize the individual to engage in the activity, irrespective of this potential outcome, which is the administrative fine upon him. So they might indemnify um, the uh, individual through... Um, paying the fine, or it might be an additional risk premium paid in salary. And there's always that theoretical concern at the very least. But yes, you can try with the individual uh, to, to impose fines. Another way of looking at it would be to um, try director disqualification orders. So you can impose an order on somebody not to engage in, in business management over a number of years. Now, I think that's good. It has a potential deterrent effect, and it has a condemnatory effect and it incapacitates the individual and ensures he doesn't engage in the cartel activity as a manager. But the problem here is that there are limitations to it. So if you have a director disqualification order, it will be imposed on a director. So it won't be imposed on anybody lower than the director, let's say, in the company hierarchy. Now, uh, that might be a concern if we're talking about a pretty large uh, organization, probably less so if we're talking about a family business. Okay, 
Second of all, if you have <coughs> a director who is approaching retirement, having the ability to act as a director taken away from him may not actually act so much as a deterrent. So if someone's you know, 65, 70, and sort of sick of being a director at this point, wants to you know, create a nice um, uh, pension for himself by engaging in cartel activity, getting rid of that directorship at some point, it wouldn't really be much of a deterrent, one could argue. Also, they're not sort of European-wide. So you get a director's qualification order in one country, it doesn't sort of apply in any other country, so it depends if the person's prepared to move and conduct business somewhere else in Europe. Uh, so there are disadvantages to it. Now, the interesting thing, I'm not saying don't do it, I think it can be a complement to the individual sanctions or a complement to criminalization if that is part of your regime and you're making it work. But the interesting thing about director's qualifications order is that in that case I was telling you about, the Marine Hoses case, where you had individuals going to prison in the United Kingdom and they were arguing for reductions in their sentences, right? They didn't want to go all the way down, they wanted to go to the United States level, fine. They, they wanted to reduce it. They didn't want to spend any longer in prison than they had to. Okay. They also got director's qualification orders. They didn't argue for a reduction in them. And given that the actual judge here was prepared to bring the sentence, to, you know, the custodial sentence down even further, maybe she might have been inclined to bring the director's qualification order down to compensate. So they'd go to prison for that time that they had to for the United States, but the director's qualification order would go down. But it wasn't argued. So one could argue, it's only one case and it's only an anecdote, but you, know, they could, you could argue it's not much of a deterrent because they don't care about it when they're caught. But nonetheless, I still stand by it. I think it can have some deterrent effect and some condemnatory effect. And particularly if someone's young and starting out in business, it might have a major impact. But there are drawbacks. And one more might come to mind is in a small business, small family business. You know, let's say you've got uh, the parent um, who is the director of the company and sons or daughters work for him. He no longer is the director. Fine, the son takes over but takes all the orders from the father anyway. Or the daughter takes over and takes all the orders from the father. So, you know, there are limitations. But they're the only two I can, I can think of, in addition, maybe naming and shaming individuals. You, know, you can see in the literature, particularly from the 1970s in the US, there were some innovative techniques that the judges tried to engage with, like, for example, requiring the convicted cartelists to go to schools or universities and give a, a lecture about you know, what he had done and um, why it was wrong. So there's a bit of redemption in that, perhaps. No, as far as I'm aware, there's no, there's no analysis of that. The assumption seems to be that the process itself is going to, you know, going through a criminal trial is going to be detrimental as, a, uh, you know, as, as it were. And also that six months might be enough. You know, Lyman talks about it being the inferno that the executive wants to avoid. So even if it's very, very short term imprisonment, it would be, um, sufficient. So it's a very good question to see what sort of length of, of, of time is, is necessary in order to ensure that that's the case. It seems to me that the assumption is that prison itself, whatever the length of time, is enough punishment to be above the level, you know, to ensure that your punishment is set at a level above the expected benefits discounted for the rate of detection. But I think that will be an area of law, an area of study I'd like to see developed. Yeah, I think that's, that's, that's a very interesting question. I think we're having difficulty enough across the globe to ensure that we have robust cartel regimes in place that are criminal in nature. And we're just focusing on the hardcore cartel activity between horizontal competitors, bringing in the vertical aspect of it, uh, sort of waters down those efforts. And I think some of those sorts of um, uh, arrangements may have efficiencies that could be brought into play. And then you've got an additional question to do with how do we deal with those is publishing agreements enough in that context. We can see why it's important with cartels. It's going to be very, very rare. You'll have situations where efficiencies are actually reality. With vertical arrangements, it becomes a bit more complicated. And we could even extend further. What about unilateral uh, behavior? But I think when you start to look at situations like that, you know, the economic concepts can be very difficult to actually analyze and prove, and particularly to a criminal standard. If you had to define a market to a criminal standard and then find dominance in that market and then find find abuse, you know, that, that could be very, very difficult. And there are questions to do with legal certainty as well that become more important with criminalization. So I can certainly see why we'd leave out 
the unilateral part of it, and the US has left it out, even though technically it, it could seek criminal sanctions for unilateral behavior. It hasn't done so since, I think, the 1960s, and it's part of a prosecutorial policy not to go after it. It also doesn't go after anything that's not per se illegal, so it avoids any sort of economic analysis where rule of reason comes in in the United States, that's left aside, it's not done criminally. And I think it's to do with the idea that it's far more complicated, it's more difficult to create moral norms against it, and you know, the efficiencies that might need to be considered just slow down the process and make it difficult to get convictions. So I don't think it's a good idea. I think it's difficult enough with the hardcore activity. If it's not as broad as we would like ideally, I can accept that provided it works for the hardcore.